Welcome to section 12.4 where we're going to wrap up molecular genetics. Now with this idea we want to understand that we do transcription and translation for a reason. This idea of the central dogma where DNA can go through transcription to become RNA, can go through translation to become a protein, where it gives you some phenotype is going to be important because it's something that can be controlled. And we're going to call this control gene regulation. So gene regulation sometimes referred to as gene expression is where if we don't transcribe a particular gene we still have that gene but we don't use it it's not expressed it's not shown and so we can kind of save it quietly this allows for us by adjusting the level of transcription by deciding whether or not to go through transcription and translation to turn genes on and off and so within our bodies, it's fairly frequent that we'll have lots of our genes turned off at any given point in time. So we're not using them. And so if we don't transcribe things, then we're not going to produce the protein. Although in some cases, too, we might produce mRNA, we might produce proteins, and we can also have mechanisms to go back and destroy those when we don't need it anymore. So we don't have a whole bunch of chemicals we're not using just sitting around. We can instead break them down through cellular respiration and at least get back some of that energy that we invested making them. So this can be a useful process to streamline the energy use in an organism. Now this also has some useful characteristics where by being able to control what genes are on or expressed, we're able to have the environment play a key role in what we look like. So we've talked about nature being the genes that we possess. So this is the potential we have. This is the proteins that we overall could produce. But we don't need every cell to produce every protein that can be made by every gene all the time. Instead, what we want is certain cells, based upon the type of cell they are, based upon the conditions that we're in, to produce only a certain amount of those genes' proteins, just the ones that we need for them to accomplish what those cells are required to. So, for instance, our liver cells and our kidney cells and our skin cells all have the exact same genes in them. But they have different genes activated in each of them that allows for them to do their particular job as a liver cell or as a skin cell or as a kidney cell. So this selective gene expression is critical to allow our cells to differentiate, to become different from each other, and it also allows us to deal with the differing environment. So that way if I eat a certain type of food, maybe my body produces certain enzymes that are needed to break that down, but I don't need to produce lots of those enzymes if I seldom eat that food. You know, that'd be a waste to keep producing an enzyme that is completely uninvolved with the meal I just had, that wasted energy. So an individual that's capable of controlling this and only producing certain things in response to a need for them, you know, only producing an enzyme in response to the actual substrate, the actual molecule being broken down by that enzyme being present, is pretty huge because now I've conserved all that energy most of the time where there was no substrate, so I don't produce the enzyme. That gives me an advantage which can then allow me to survive better and reproduce better and pass on this ability to control gene expression in response to what I see in the environment. And so that's why this nurture idea, the environmental idea in nature versus nurture is so interesting because it's not so much that those are in some way affecting what genes you have, they're affecting the way in which you use the genes that you have. Because it is possible to effectively block, this is our DNA, block the DNA to prevent things like RNA polymerase from attaching, which can prevent transcription. You can also remove those proteins, which allows for transcription to allow for the production of the protein it makes. Now one way we can also further mess with stuff to kind of change things genetically is not just turning them on or off, which is really not much of a change in the actual code, but we can actually mess with the code itself, and that's going to be mutations. So this is where we change the nucleotide sequence in DNA. So point mutations are going to be some of the most common mutations that we'll see, where we're just changing one particular nucleotide. And most of the time, this is just a substitution. So we're swapping out a T for a C. Now this might seem like, all right, we've changed it definitely, this is going to have an effect. But in many cases, a point mutation won't even have an effect because it only can change one amino acid max. And we've talked about this idea that because our genetic code is a redundant code, where there's many different codons that code for the same amino acid, in some cases we'll actually swap out one of these nucleotides, but it'll still code for the same amino acid. So at that point we haven't changed the protein it produces at all.
In other cases, we will change one of these amino acids that's part of this protein. But depending on what type of amino acid it changes to, many amino acids have similar behaviors. So you still might get a protein that pretty much does what it did before. So these mutations are considered some of the more minor ones if you just have a point substitution. So some of the more severe ways we can screw things up is the first one being a frame shift. So this is where we're adding one or more bases, but typically not multiples of three. If you add in like three nucleotides, because you just add one amino acid, that's not going to be as damaging. But especially if you add in like one or two or four or five, etc., amino acids or delete them, what you end up doing is screwing up the reading frame of how we do this. So as an example, we normally have this idea of reading in codons, reading in threes, the cat ate the rat. But if I go through and delete just a single nucleotide, not a full three, but if I just remove one letter, in this case the C, you'll notice everybody else still needs to be read in threes. So our reading frame, you know, the ribosome as it goes through, is now reading different combinations of letters for every word after the screw up, because it still needs to read in threes. So with the C and cat gone, it now grabs the A from eight, and that becomes a codon. You know, now you get this happening with every additional one where it shifts over, and so every word that there would have been after that now gets shifted where it kind of grabs a letter from the word after it and becomes, at least for reading purposes, gibberish. But for the purposes of translation, it now becomes a different amino acid most likely. So in the case of a frame shift, you're going to change every amino acid mostly. I mean, there might be a couple that somehow manage to be the same. But for a frame shift, you're effectively changing every amino acid after the mutation. And so this is why especially frame shifts that occur early in a gene or in the middle of a gene are very damaging. If it's at the very, very end of a gene, it might be not quite as bad. But these things are still going to change a lot of amino acids. And when you change a lot of amino acids, you get a drastically different protein. And that drastically different protein is normally not going to do the job it's supposed to, which means this can be lethal, this can be very damaging. Now the other type of big screw up is chromosomal. And this one's normally going to revolve around not getting a whole extra chromosome or a missing one like non-disjunction. We're going to focus more on screwing up crossing over. In crossing over, you're supposed to swap equivalent pieces. But sometimes this gets botched where one of them grabs both of those pieces, and so now it's got an addition. It's got an extra piece. We call that a duplication. Now the next guy who didn't get any piece at all because he tried to swap, but he got screwed, that guy now has a missing piece, which we typically call a deletion. You can also have where you flip it, so you kind of try to swap stuff, but one of them got flipped, so when it reattaches, it's kind of upside down. That's called an inversion or flipping it. And so ultimately, any of these are going to mean that there's a whole bunch of extra missing or misplaced DNA, and that causes major changes typically. This is not like a minor OK thing. Stuff is not where it's supposed to be, and this can have major effects on the organism. Now the effects of a mutation is that we can get the same protein, so this means we're unaffected. It could make a protein that still works but is just less effective. So when you talk about like sickle cell, the cells that you produce here that are sickle shaped do a worse job at being a blood cell, but they still function. So it's not like you're going to die immediately because you have sickle cell disease. It's going to have complications certainly, but it still does enough of a job that you live even without treatment normally for multiple years. You can also get where it has a completely different function, where we've made a protein that just is a completely different protein. Now, in most cases, if you no longer have the protein that's supposed to be made, and if that's an important protein, you could just be dead. But in some cases, if it's not as critical of a protein, you could actually get a new protein that does something better, does something different for you. And so this could actually work out to be good on some occasions. So while mutations usually are kind of neutral, is what you consider here, or bad, there are going to be some that occur periodically that are good, and those are what allow for things to continue to evolve when they do happen. So mutation as a whole, try to avoid it, but there are some good things that come from mutation. And then lastly, you could screw something up where you just don't get a protein. I mean, if you damage something critical, like at the start of a gene, there's a sequence that lets it know this is the start of a gene called the promoter. If you were to screw that up, you can make it where your, your I guess we'll say genetic mechanics cannot identify there's even a gene there, so it could never be transcribed. You've effectively wiped it out. So at that point, you would get no protein at all. You just completely erase that gene, if you will. So there's lots of different effects mutations can have.
So how is it that we tend to get mutations? Now sometimes we naturally can get mutations just by replicating our DNA. There are some level of mistakes that can occur when you do this, so that's certainly possible. But a lot of the ways that we can get things more rapidly is to get exposed to some type of mutagen. Now mutagens are just some substance, some situation environmentally that causes mutations to occur at a higher rate. This is basically another term you could say for like carcinogens. So a lot of the same things that were carcinogens are also going to be mutagens. So UV light, gamma or x-ray radiation, there's a variety of chemicals that you're going to be exposed to that once again we'd normally also call carcinogens, whether it's from smoking, etc. And these tend to increase the amount of mutations that occur. And because those mutations can also lead to cancer, you'll see why there's this crossover between mutagens that just cause mutations in general and carcinogens, which are substances that cause mutations, which can then therefore lead to cancer because cancer is a situation that arises from multiple mutations in the same cell. So there's a tight connection here and just kind of link those two where mutagens are very much about the same thing as carcinogens. And then the other last important bit is we've talked about body cells. This is kind of like the carcinogen idea. We can have them mutate and bad things can happen like cancer. You know, in general, it's just going to affect a small number of cells though. Although with cancer, because those cells can spread throughout your body, it can eventually get elsewhere. But if I mutate my skin cell to shoot laser beams from my eyes, it's not my eye cells. So I cannot shoot laser beams from my eyes. But if I have a mutation occur in a gamete, in a sex cell, in an egg or a sperm, because every cell of that new organism will have that mutation, right? Because you're going to have the sperm is going to meet up with the egg. And once they get together, we get a zygote. So this will be the first cell that is you. So if that mutation is in this zygote, that zygote does mitosis trillions of times to make you. And so every cell in that new organism has that mutation. So if they had some gene to shoot laser beams out of their eyes, they would be able to shoot laser beams out of their eyes because their eye cells would have that mutation. Mine don't because it happened in my skin cell, so only that skin cell or the descendants of it in my arm right here would have it. So it would not be useful. So it's critical when we talk about a lot of these mutations, we're only going to care about it if it's in a sex cell because those are the mutations that are evolutionarily significant because they are now what we call the germline. You know, they're now within the actual population and that organism that has it can display it and that organism that has it can pass it on to his offspring so it can now continue through the population, through the species, it can spread. Something that occurs in one individual's body cells that typically cannot be passed down, it cannot be spread, and so it is not as evolutionarily significant because it can't be passed down to future generations.